Hello everybody and welcome back. I'm Ted, your host, and we are continuing our discourse, our discussion on the mid-20th century civil rights movement. Now, we last left off, uh, we were speaking about the uh, two instances that really sparked um, the resistance of the African American community, uh, particularly in the Deep South. That would be the lynching of Emmett Till uh, for allegedly whistling at a uh, at Carolyn Brandt, uh, a Bryant, um, a uh, a young uh, European American woman. Um, he was murdered by her husband and his brother and his uh, his half brother. Now, uh, the murder of Till sort of galvanized the community because uh, it was widely known and not really accepted, but um, sort of just a um, sort of just the social condition that, that African Americans had to put up to the, was that men would be targeted for lynchings uh, just to ensure order and to um, sort of uh, in, instill that communal fear to, um, to, uh, to continually defer to European Americans and that women would be raped uh, to illustrate that not only did the men have to uh, taper their behavior in the presence of European Americans, but, um, but they were also unable to uh, def uh, defend or protect uh, female members of the community. But Till's murder illustrated something else, something frightening, in that children would be targeted, that children would be murdered, and that uh, galvanized the community to act. Um, and then, of course, uh, Parks. Parks was an upstanding uh, community member of the African American community in Montgomery, and she had been arrested and uh, convicted of disorderly conduct for refusing to give up her seat on a bus to a uh, to a um, European American gentleman who boarded the bus. Uh, those two events sort of um, uh, led to the uh, those those two events didn't sort of they they actively led to the Montgomery bus boycott that we discussed in our last lecture um, that was uh, overseen by the Montgomery Improvement Association. Um, and we'll, we'll pick up right there with, uh, with the MIA organization. Uh, and now to uh, ensure that the bus boycott stayed in effect, the Montgomery Improvement Organization organized teams of cab drivers and carpoolers to take people to home and to work uh, to counteract the impromptu strategy uh, to resist uh, Jim Crow segregation, Montgomery City officials instructed police officers to harass African American drivers, arresting them for driving too fast or for, too, or for driving too slow. Uh, at meetings between city officials and MIA leadership, negotiations quickly fell, fell through had both sides failed had both sides failed to reach agreements on segregation and hiring practices. The failure of the meetings led local white supremacists to uh, conclude that outside influences had cast a spell over their good and obedient Negroes. Uh, this will be a rallying cry um, for the remainder of the civil rights movement that outside influences were coming in here and riling up or stirring up our good Negroes who know their place. Um, it will be a, a rallying cry that um, that will persist long after the uh, the end of this of this phase of the civil rights movement. Um, now, uh, their their wrath, the wrath of the white supremacists, fell on African American community leaders who they believed were aided by communists. Uh, they embarked on a domestic bombing campaign, uh, targeting churches, private homes. And, uh, and private businesses. The city of Montgomery went as far as to issue arrest warrants for King and other African American leaders solely for engaging in the city bus boycott. Uh, the fact that the warrants were issued without just cost or, or legal excuse was perfectly exploited by the MIA leadership who turned themselves in under coverage from national press agencies. By the summer of 1956, the Montgomery bus boycott had become a first page uh, story, a, a bestseller. Uh, King had become the face of the civil rights movement, and in June, it was ruled at a uh, lower federal court that segregated seating was unconstitutional, and reaffirmed by the Supreme Court later that year. In a significant victory for Parks, Abernathy, King, and the MIA, the events of the boycotts um, 
the, the, the success of the boycott and the events surrounding it would have great effect, uh, a great effect uh, for the African American community. And the nation found a new and great sense of dignity and destiny. Um, many began to look towards civil rights and uh, with more enthusiasm, with more passion. Um, Nonviolent resistance became the new and powerful weapon for the civil rights leaders. Now, the Montgomery bus boycott began as an impromptu act of resistance born out of spontaneity. Uh, the next phase of the mid 20th century civil rights movement, the lunch counter sit ins were deliberate and were carefully orchestrated to gather uh, as much national attention as possible. And their target was the Woolworths in Greenboro, North Carolina, uh, which, like all other businesses in the United States, maintained a strict segregationist policy. Uh, these businesses allowed African Americans to patronize their establishments. However, they refused to allow African American patrons to eat at their lunch counter, uh, which is remembered as a particularly stinging insult had it implied that the presence of African Americans might contaminate other patrons. Uh, this particular brand of Jim Crow was not limited to lunch counters. It also applied to theaters, hotels, restaurants, um, which if they did not outright bar African Americans, offered them distinctly inferior service and separate seating. Um, nor was this policy restricted to the poor African American community. When, um, when film star Dorothy Dandridge swam in a Las Vegas swimming pool, it was immediately drained, cleaned, and we and refilled before uh, the European American painters were allowed to re-enter. Um, and, in, and, in, and in particular, with swimming pools, uh, when when the uh, when in segregated communities, uh, whenever they wanted to get the African American uh, money, whenever they wanted to um, sort of receive African American patrons, they would typically close the pool to European Americans, and it would admit African Americans. But immediately after the African Americans left, it, they would clean it. They would allow them in on cleaning day, um, so there was sort of a double up on their funds on a day in which they were going to have the clean pooled anyway. They would simply defer it for a time, allow the African Americans in the pool, and then once they left, they would clean it. They would spend the day cleaning it like they normally would. Um, but, uh, but, but jumping back into our narrative uh, with the Greensboro Four, on the, the 5th of February, 1960, four students, uh, Ezel Blair Jr., Franklin McCain, Joseph McNeil and David Richmond from North Carolina Agricultural and Technical College sat down at the Woolworths lunch counter and ordered lunch. The staff refused to serve them uh, and the four sat there until the store closed. Undeterred, the foursome returned the very next day and the staff again refused to serve them. Once again, once again, uh, with this dance continuing for the next five days with them sitting at the counter trying to order and the staff refusing to to, to serve them. Uh, as news of the protest spread, uh, the community reacted and, and became involved. Segregation and mobs showed up to confront the foursome. They verbally attacked and physically assaulted them. Uh, the foursome persisted and resisted attempts to break their spirits. The courage and the boldness of their actions spread to another 126 cities uh, in the Southeast with over 50,000 protesters participating. Uh, the most successful protests took place in Nashville, Tennessee, where local authorities um, organized into teams and sat in all of the city's businesses, forcing the businesses to integrate. Now, while the protests were going on, City officials scrambled for a response to break the protest. They settled on violence, uh, police intimidation, which led to the arrest of over, of over, of over 35,000 protesters during the sit-ins uh, for disturbing the peace. The sit-ins were nonetheless successful. Due to the loss of revenue, the businesses suffered. Uh, the sit-ins at Woolworth were especially 
especially devastating for the company because the loss of customers and consumer relations nightmare sparked national boycotts due to television coverage. Uh, the boycotts left from Woolworths to other department stores and enlightened the leaders of the civil rights movement to the youthfulness of student idealism, activism, and passion. They were also drawn to the civil rights, uh, they were also drawn to the students due to their freedom from responsibilities most of all. Uh, the students, um, they really didn't have the social pressures that the other leaders of the movement had. Um, other than physical assaults, uh, they did not have much uh, to really be threatened by, by their participation in, in the sit-ins. Uh, they didn't have jobs that they had that they would lose. Um, and, uh, and really, uh, unfortunately, the, the work that happened to them, um, besides the physical assaults, was that a few were expelled from their schools. Now, the SCLC, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, sent Ella Baker, a top organizer, to serve as a liaison with the students. Uh, together with the students, Baker held, um, ba ba Baker held, uh, helped them to found the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, um, better known as uh, SNCC, SNCC, SNCC. Um, the tactics used by the SCLC and SNCC were successful in the upper states of the Southeast, like Virginia, Tennessee, and North Carolina. They were not successful at all in the states of the lower or deep south, places like uh, Georgia, South Carolina, Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana. They were not successful at all in those states. Um, towns in the deep south uh, simply outlaw protests and arrest the protesters before they could begin their sit-ins. Segregationists in Montgomery, Alabama jumped out ahead of the situation with store owners simply refusing to serve African Americans. And city officials lent their support to the store owners by declaring that stores were the personal property of the business owners uh, who could make any rules for service they saw fit. Now this hardened new tactic, however, failed to dissuade African American leaders from pushing for integration. Uh, after challenge to integration intensified, a new tactic was devised, the Freedom Rides, which challenged public transportation facilities at the interstate level. Now, unlike, unlike the Montgomery bus boycott, uh, boycotts, this tactic put African Americans on buses. Um, that was sort of a pun. Uh, I hope you guys got it. The Montgomery bus boycotts were, of course, them getting off the bus. The Freedom Ride were them getting on the bus. Uh, the Freedom Rides were organized by the uh, Congress of Racial Equality, an organization that, that had been founded back in 1942. Now, CORE was a multi-ethnic organization that had inaugurated the use of sit-in protest. In 1947, CORE sent a cohort of 16 ethnically mixed, bu uh, mixed bus riders into the Upper South to challenge the journey. Uh, um, in, into the Upper South to, uh, to challenge, um, uh, on a journey, I should say, that challenged um, and really captured the nation's uh, attention. Unfortunately, three of the, organize, of the organizers were arrested and uh, sent to work on chain gangs in North Carolina. In May of uh, 1961, uh, flushed with inspiration by the recent success of the Supreme Court case of Boynton v. Virginia and the success of the sit-ins um, in North Carolina, uh, James Farmer, the director of CORE, launched a new round of Freedom Rides uh, that entailed sending small bands I apologize about that. It's been a very, very long day. Um, James Farmer, the director of CORE, uh, launched a new round of freedom rides that entailed sending small bands of ethnically mixed groups uh, from Washington, D.C. to New Orleans to challenge segregation practices at restrooms, re uh, waiting rooms, and restaurants. Now, the the first bus was sent with uh, was set on fire in Anniston, uh, Alabama. Uh, the kids were then beaten as they fled from the from the from the flames. 
Uh, other groups were beaten at Montgomery uh, and Birmingham. Uh, then, uh, then sitting Alabama governor James Patterson added fuel to the fire by publicly stating that he could not. Uh, Patterson added fuel to the fire by saying that he could not publicly um, that 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 he that, that he publicly could not guarantee protection for this bunch of rabble rousers. Robert Kennedy, the uh, then sitting attorney general, sent in federal authorities to uh, to guard the Freedom Riders, and uh, sent instructions to the Interstate Commerce uh, Commission to enforce. Um, regulations against Jim Crow segregation and transportation facilities with the weight of the federal government uh, coming down on them most Dixiecrats buckled. Uh, municipalities accepted the orders and integrated interstate bus and rail stations. Uh, core and other pacifist civil rights organizations had learned a valuable lesson uh, uh, once again about engaging in peaceful demonstration um, that provoked segregationist violence resulting in a jarring image that uh, stirred up the nation's uh, international outrage. Had the events unfolded, it appeared that the segregationists had failed to learn the lesson at the same time. Uh, here, we shall break again, and uh, we will come back uh, and we will continue our discourse on civil rights. Uh, on the civil rights movement of the mid 20th century. As always, I'm Ted. Hit like, subscribe, and comment, and I will see you guys next time for, uh, for another lecture.